We found ourselves atop the weathered rooftop of the abandoned warehouse, exchanging smiles amidst the glow of the flames. With me was John Houseman, my fellow hoseman from Truck 62. I, as the captain leading Truck 62 on B-Shift, oversaw our crew. Close by, on the ladder stood Paul Raglesh, our other hoseman assigned to Truck 62. Down below, Randy Singletary, my trusted equipment operator, kept a vigilant eye on us from near the controls of the aerial platform. Our task was straightforward yet crucial to cut open the roof of the burning warehouse. Once a bustling wood trim mill, it had now transformed into a storage space for donated furniture overseen by a local ministry. Familiarity with the premises was ingrained in us, having battled numerous smaller fires ignited by the accumulated refuse over the years. However, this fire presented a unique challenge. Unnoticed for nearly a day, it had engulfed a significant portion of the warehouse by the time it was discovered. While Engine 62 and Engine 48 tackled the inferno from within using 2.5-inch hand lines, our battalion chief directed Truck 62 to focus on opening the roof directly above the fire's core. Armed with quickie saws, axes, and pry bars, we ascended to execute our mission. John was always the one wielding the saw, standing at an impressive 6-6 six, six inches of pure muscle, grit, and sinew. He embodied the essence of physical strength. We had started our journey together in the academy, members of the same rookie class, 22 years ago. While I pursued every promotional exam available, John remained steadfast in his role as a hose man on a truck company, relishing the heavy lifting and physical labor it entailed. Our divergent career paths eventually converged, leading us both to Truck 62. With the precision of a seasoned surgeon, John expertly operated the heavy gas-powered quickie saw to execute a standard ventilation opening. As the roof section swung open flawlessly on its center rafter, a dense column of smoke billowed out, offering immediate relief to the crews battling the blaze within. Standing beside John, assessing the ventilation and organizing our tools, I suddenly witnessed him falter. In a desperate attempt to regain his balance, his hand inadvertently struck my shoulder, propelling me backward towards the parapet wall encircling the roof. Colliding with the hard surface, I felt the weight of my composite cylinder pressing into my back, momentarily stunning me. As I struggled to comprehend the situation, I looked up to see John's startled expression behind the mask of his breathing apparatus. My heart sank as I watched him vanish into the abyss below, swallowed by a massive eruption of flames leaping skyward through the newly created ventilation hole. I cautiously approached the widened hole in the roof, sensing its spongy edges indicating imminent danger. Peering down into the abyss, I was met with a scene reminiscent of Dante's Inferno. Suddenly, a firm grip seized my ankle, yanking me away just as another portion of the roof crumbled away. Reacting swiftly, I scrambled back towards the ladder, descending quickly alongside Paul. As I descended, I activated the push to talk button on the microphone attached to my SCBA harness, urgently broadcasting, man down, man down, truck 62. Upon reaching solid ground, I tore off my helmet and face mask, sprinting towards the command post. Battalion Chief Andy Spellman intercepted me, having already heard the distress call and issuing orders over the radio. Backup crews, alerted by the call for assistance, were already in motion towards the scene. The urgency of the situation prompted the activation of third and fourth alarm responses. Coming to a halt, I met Andy's gaze, his expression reflecting concern and anticipation. What happened? He inquired, awaiting my account of the unfolding events. We wrapped up the ventilation cut, everything appeared normal, then I noticed John losing his footing and he pushed me backward. I hit the ground, and when I managed to look back he was gone swallowed by the hole, I recounted. He fell through the roof? Andy clarified. No, I believe the roof collapsed beneath him. His shove probably saved me from the same fate, I explained. Andy absorbed the information, issuing revised orders to locate John. An ambulance arrived, 
followed by additional fire units. Amidst the flurry of activity, Andy addressed me. Kevin, gather your team and reassemble your truck. Your part in this is done. Take a break, grab some water or coffee, and find a quiet spot, he instructed. Acknowledging his directive, I joined my teammates, delegated tasks, and sought solace on the far side of the truck. Attempting to settle onto the step, I ended up slumping with elbows on my knees. All I could picture was John's expression as he vanished into darkness. Waves of nausea overcame me, leaving me retching until there was nothing left. Paul and Randy must have heard my distress as they silently approached where I sat, still reeling from shock. Without a word, they helped me up, guiding me to sit on the steps of the truck. Standing close, they formed a protective huddle around me, offering silent support until the radio crackled to life once more. Truck 33 Command, came the transmission. Command, I replied. We are headed out with one casualty. Have the EMTs meet us at the door, the voice on the radio instructed. With the EMTs already en route, my team and I rounded the tail end of our truck, making our way towards the entrance. Emerging from the smoke-filled doorway, Truck 33 appeared, bearing John on a gurney. The EMTs swiftly sprang into action, attending to him with urgency. I watched as they cut the straps, securing his air pack, and removed his helmet and mask, revealing the damage inflicted by the intense heat. The melted Lexan shield on his helmet resembled a congealed mess, fused to the face mask and Truck 63 shield. As his bunker gear was carefully removed, Revealing his ashen complexion and labored breathing, one of the EMTs performed intubation, while the others worked tirelessly. With the bag valve mask in place, I witnessed the first signs of life as John's chest rose and fell rhythmically. Despite the protection offered by his gear, I knew it couldn't shield him entirely from the ferocious heat he endured. The possibility of internal injuries loomed, a harsh reminder of the dangers we faced in our line of work. Another EMT, swiftly attached, leads to John's chest and legs, while the machine situated between his legs emitted a few beeps. Without visibility of the monitor, I could only hope for the presence of his heartbeat, as the absence of chest compressions indicated. As the ambulance crew maneuvered the gurney towards the exit, the back door slammed shut, signaling their departure with blaring lights and sirens, leaving behind a somber atmosphere. By the time the ambulance departed, the deputy chief had arrived on scene, not assuming command but gathering essential details for the impending departmental investigation. Chaplains were already initiating necessary notifications. Before departing, the deputy chief instructed the battalion chief to release our truck company and return us to the station. Back at the station, Randy skillfully guided the truck into the bay, where the crew promptly restored it to readiness. While they tended to their duties, I retreated to my office to tackle paperwork. With one member down, we were officially out of service until the next shift change at 6 a.m. I reclined in my desk chair, closing my eyes, haunted by the recurring image of John's anguished expression before he vanished into darkness. I heard the ringing of my personal cell phone echoing from the bedroom adjacent to my office. Typically, I didn't carry it during calls. As I located the phone, I recognized the caller as my wife, her voice fraught with panic and fear. Kevin, I heard the news. Was that John? Is he okay? She exclaimed, tears evident in her trembling voice. Her distress didn't fully register with me in the moment. John and I shared a long history, and he was a frequent visitor to our home. Living just a couple of streets away, he and his wife were integral parts of our off-duty lives. Over the years, our families had grown exceptionally close. Joan and Katie, like John and me, shared a bond that transcended mere friendship. It was John, I confirmed solemnly. Oh God, is he okay? She implored. I don't know, I admitted, my own uncertainty weighing heavily. He fell hard and was engulfed by the fire. He wasn't conscious or breathing when they brought him out. I don't have any more information yet. Her sobs pierced through the phone line, and I listened in silence for a moment, feeling utterly helpless. Katie, I urged gently, you need to call Joan. She's going to need all the support she can get. 
My wife managed to compose herself enough to inform me that she would be heading to Joan and John's house. With a sudden click, she hung up, leaving me in a daze, struggling to process the events unfolding before me. Rising from my seat, I made my way to the fire station kitchen, seeking solace in a cup of coffee. The brew had been prepared before our dispatch to the warehouse fire, and the pot still retained its warmth as I poured myself a serving. Though thick and bitter, it provided a semblance of comfort as I settled into a chair, lost in thought. Gradually, my fellow crew members trickled into the kitchen, each silently seeking refuge in their own cup of coffee. Conversation was sparse, the weight of the situation hanging heavily in the air. As the shift change approached, the incoming crew arrived, their demeanor mirroring the solemn atmosphere of the station. We exchanged brief nods and subdued greetings as we quietly transitioned duties. With the changeover complete, I exited the station and made my way home in my Bronco. Arriving at the darkened house, the absence of both my wife and children was keenly felt. With the kids at school, and Katie, presumably with Joan, the emptiness of the silent abode only served to amplify the sense of unease that gripped me. Though it was only 8 a.m., the day already felt impossibly heavy with sorrow. After a long, hot shower and a change of clothes, I resolved to visit Joan and John's house, hoping for any news from the hospital about John's condition. Upon arriving, I noticed Katie's car in the driveway, prompting me to park on the street before approaching the open front door. Stepping inside, I was unprepared for what greeted me. In the familiar oversized recliner that typically belonged to John, two figures were entwined in an intimate embrace, oblivious to my presence. The massive chair, reclined to its fullest extent, cradled them as they shared a deep and passionate kiss, lost in their own world. I stood frozen in the doorway, unable to comprehend what I was witnessing. For how long I stood there, I couldn't say. Joan's hand slipped beneath Katie's blouse, eliciting a shared moan without breaking their kiss. Slowly I retreated, quietly opening and closing the glass door behind me before making my way to the porch. Disoriented and bewildered, I climbed into my Bronco, the engine roaring to life as I pulled away without a destination in mind, operating on autopilot. The events of the morning left me numb, the reality of the situation sinking in with each passing moment. Arriving at the hospital, I was greeted by a somber gathering of fellow firefighters in the waiting room, their silent but heartfelt expressions speaking volumes. Most of them understood the close bond I shared with John and his integral role in my crew. As I stepped off the elevator, I was met with a wave of solidarity as they approached me. Without words, their supportive presence provided a measure of comfort amidst the uncertainty. Finding solace in a cup of coffee, I listened as some of the others filled me in on John's condition. The extent of his injuries was staggering. He suffered second and third-degree burns covering a large portion of his body, particularly his hands. Compromised by the fall, his airway and lungs bore additional damage. Currently undergoing surgery to repair a badly broken leg, there was also concern for potential skull trauma, though this would be addressed once his other injuries were stabilized. The absence of any prognosis hung heavy in the air, casting a shadow over the room. Amongst the murmurs, I noticed the absence of Joan, John's spouse. It was unusual for a spouse not to be present at a time like this, typically accompanied by the fire department chaplain. Feeling a gentle touch on my shoulder, I turned to see Father Dominic, clad in his fire department uniform, beckoning me to follow him. With a solemn nod, I trailed behind him as he led me to a nearby consultation room and closed the door behind us his pained expression mirroring the gravity of the situation. "'Kevin, have you spoken to Joan or your wife?' Father Dominic inquired gently. I shook my head, preempting his further words with a somber revelation. "'Father, I went by John's house right after shift change. I have a feeling where this is headed. I hope you can keep this under wraps. This situation is already difficult enough without adding more emotional turmoil.' Understanding the gravity of the situation, Father Dominic placed a comforting hand on my shoulder. Kevin, I know it seems dire, 
but don't jump to conclusions until you have all the facts. I nodded, tears threatening to spill from my eyes. Using my shirt sleeve to wipe them away, I managed a week. Thanks, Father. I should return to the waiting room. Stepping back into the waiting room, I was met with questioning glances from my fellow firefighters. They were aware of the close bond between John, Joan, Katie, and me, and their curiosity lingered unspoken. Unable to articulate my emotions coherently, I remained silent, choosing instead to focus on thoughts of John as I wrestled with my tumultuous feelings. Two hours later, Joan and Katie entered the waiting room, their tear-stained faces betraying their anguish. As the others rose to greet Joan, I remained seated at the back, still grappling with my own emotions and uncertain about the situation. Many of my fellow firefighters glanced between Katie and me, awaiting some indication of what transpired. Katie made her way across the room, settling beside me and gently taking my hand. I regarded her with a vacant expression as she voiced her concern. Are you okay? I don't know yet, I admitted, my thoughts still scattered. Her brow furrowed slightly in confusion. Why? You don't think this was your fault, do you? I shook my head. John? No. In fact, he probably saved me from following him down that hole. A flicker of fear crossed Katie's eyes. Were you that close to him when this happened? I nodded solemnly. The roof started to give way under us. He shoved me backward just before he disappeared. I saw his face as he went out of sight. As Katie began to sob, seeking solace by resting her head on my shoulder, I remained unresponsive, feeling an icy numbness enveloping me from within. Around us, I noticed several onlookers who had been listening intently, their gaze fixed on me as they reached for their phones, perhaps to spread the news. Avoiding any interaction with Joan, I observed as the others kept her occupied, with female firefighters offering their support and companionship. Uncertain of what to say or do in such dire circumstances, I remained silent and withdrawn. Eventually, a nurse entered the room, seeking out Joan, and I overheard her somber update. The severity of John's injuries sent a shiver down my spine. He might lose both his hands due to the extent of the burns, and his lungs and torso were also a cause for concern. Despite a successful leg surgery, additional procedures loomed ahead. As Joan relayed the grim news, the nurse directed us to the ICU recovery room, prompting us to follow in silence. As we made our way to the elevators, subdued murmurs filled the air, but I remained silent, Katie clinging to my arm for support. In the waiting room, I found a chair and sank into it, still consumed by a sense of detachment. Despite Katie's attempts to engage me in conversation, I remained passive and unresponsive, gradually realizing that I was entangled in the midst of not one, but two tragedies, facing the impending loss of both my best friend and potentially my marriage. Hours passed before a nurse arrived to accompany Joan to John's room, granting her precious moments by his side, despite his unconscious state. As the other firefighters gradually dispersed, arrangements were made by the Union to ensure a constant presence at the hospital, with at least two firefighters on rotation. Throughout the ordeal, I remained seated in silence, my emotions tightly restrained. Katie, sensing my withdrawal, eventually ceased her attempts to engage me in conversation, resigning herself to my aloofness. Not once did I meet her gaze or acknowledge her presence since her arrival. Eventually, her voice broke through the silence, urging me to eat. Kevin, you need to get something to eat. Let's stop at Folsom's Diner and grab a burger, then get you home. You look terrible. I offered a simple nod in agreement, rising from my seat as we made our way towards the elevators. As we walked, Katie continued, arranging the details of our plan, ensuring Joan had transportation home when needed, and confirming my ability to drive. At the diner, we each ordered my favorite, a hearty American-style burger with hand-cut fries and a large soda. Katie allowed me to focus on my meal, providing a welcome distraction from the turmoil within. Once I had finished eating, I settled back into the booth, finally willing to engage with her. 
It took you and Joan a long time to get to the hospital, I remarked, my curiosity piqued. Katie looked puzzled. I was surprised you were already there. Why? It was after eleven. I got off at six and went by the house to shower and change clothes. I figured you and Joan were already at the hospital. Oh, I went to their house. Joan was nearly in hysterics. The fire department chaplain was there and stayed for a while. He offered to take us both to the hospital. I tried to get her to calm down. She was still in her pajamas. I told the chaplain I would see that she got to the hospital, so he left. Joan was finally able to change clothes, and we headed to the hospital. As Katie recounted the events, I mentally tallied the timeline. Checking the dispatch logs could confirm, but I was fairly certain the fire department chaplain would have notified Joan soon after John was taken by ambulance, likely between 4 and 5 a.m. They don't delay such notifications. When I had called Katie, it was almost 6 a.m. nearing the end of the shift change. She had mentioned going straight to Joan's house, placing her arrival between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. My own visit to Joan's house had been between 8 o'clock and 9 a.m., yet Joan and Katie hadn't reached the hospital until almost 11. As Katie recounted the events, her gaze remained fixed on her half-eaten burger, an uncharacteristic behavior that should have raised suspicion. Despite this, I chose not to disclose my earlier visit to Joan's house, opting instead to sip on my soda as my thoughts swirled. Let's go home. I'm exhausted, I finally declared, breaking the uneasy silence that lingered between us. The drive home was shrouded in silence, both of us lost in our own thoughts. I could sense Katie's curiosity about my demeanor just as I pondered the enigma of her actions. Arriving home, I retrieved a beer from the fridge, unwilling to retire to bed early. The memory of John's fall haunted me, compounded by the unsettling events at Joan's house. Katie attempted to engage me in conversation, but my responses remained terse. Eventually, I retired to bed, slipping into a pair of running shorts before deciding to fetch a glass of milk from the kitchen. Passing by the den, I overheard Katie's hushed voice on the phone. She was unaware of my presence, prompting me to pause and eavesdrop, intrigued by her late-night call. I could only hear one side of the conversation, but what I did hear was disturbing. Joni, how is John? Katie's voice carried concern as she spoke into the phone. What is the prognosis? Her inquiry echoed my own worries. How are you holding up? She continued, her tone softening with empathy. I know. I want to be there to hold you as well. Maybe tomorrow. Her words conveyed a sense of longing. I don't know. I can't tell how he is doing. He isn't very talkative right now. I think it's the shock and trauma of John's accident. I am sure he will come out of it in a few days. Katie relayed, her uncertainty evident. He hasn't said anything. It wouldn't surprise me if he took a shift or two off, but he is so damn dedicated to that fire station. He may very well go back on duty, she added, a hint of admiration in her voice. I haven't thought about it. If you feel okay not being at the hospital, I don't have a problem, she responded, her consideration evident. Okay, I'll come by the hospital tomorrow. I'm sure that Kevin will want to visit to check on you and John, she concluded before hanging up. As Katie ended the call, I retreated down the hall, feeling a wave of dizziness wash over me. Collapsing onto the bed, I curled up, my mind swirling with thoughts. Sleep eventually claimed me oblivious to Katie's arrival in bed later that night. The next morning I found Katie in the kitchen, preparing breakfast with coffee already brewed. She offered a variety of options, from eggs and bacon to toast and pancakes, and I nodded my acceptance as I poured myself a cup of coffee. Settling down at the table, I casually inquired about her plans for the day. She didn't turn to look at me while she was cooking eggs. Oh, I have some errands to run this morning. I need to do some grocery shopping. I thought I would go up to the hospital this afternoon. Do you want to come? Sure. What time? After lunch. What are you going to do until then? I'm not sure. I'm still a little overwhelmed. This has all happened so fast. It's sometimes frightening how quickly life can change, isn't it? I grunted. Little did she know or understand. That afternoon we went to the hospital. We still couldn't go back to the ICU to see John. 
Joan came out to the waiting room looking exhausted. She had been at the hospital all night and day. Katie hugged her and looked her over. You need to go home and rest for a while. A shower and a change of clothes would make you feel better. Let me take you home. You can rest, shower, eat something, change, and then I'll bring you back. I don't want to leave in case there's a change in John's condition. Katie looked at me and then back at Joan. Kevin will stay here. If anything changes, he can call. If something happens, we can be back in 15 minutes. You need a break. Joan looked at me. Is that okay? I nodded. Joan went back to John's room to get her purse. I turned to Katie. How long do you think you'll be? I'm not sure. It could be anywhere from an hour to a couple of hours. It depends on Joan. She needs to sleep, and I wouldn't want to disturb her. That all made sense on the surface. Okay, just try not to be too long. I don't have my phone charger. Katie smiled. I have mine in my purse. I'll leave it with you. Joan came back into the waiting room. Katie gave me a small kiss on the cheek, and then she and Joan headed out. I walked to the double doors and watched through the small window. As Joan and Katie entered the elevator, I saw them smiling and holding hands. Just before the doors closed, I was almost sure I saw them kiss. Fortunately, the waiting room had a nice Keurig coffee maker and a wide variety of K-cups. We arrived at the hospital around 1.30 p.m., by 5.30, I called Katie's phone, but it went to voicemail. I tried Joan's phone and got the same result. After several attempts, I was famished by 6 p.m., so I headed down to the cafeteria to find something to eat. I had just finished paying for my Reuben sandwich, chips, and a soda when I looked through the cafeteria window and saw Joan and Katie coming across the parking lot. I stopped and nearly dropped the tray. They were walking hand in hand, laughing and chatting as if they didn't have a care in the world. As they neared the entrance, they stepped into a slight niche that was shielded from the main entrance, but not from the mirrored glass of the cafeteria. I watched in shock as they moved into each other's arms and kissed. This wasn't a sisterly kiss or a neighborly peck. They entwined themselves and locked lips. My appetite vanished as they entered the hospital. I set the forgotten tray of food on a nearby table and headed toward the elevators. I got there before them and caught a ride up to the ICU waiting area. I was sitting in the same chair when they entered the room. I watched them. They were no longer holding hands or chatting and laughing. Joan had a somber look and Katie seemed to mirror it. As they approached, Katie didn't waste any time. Sorry, Joan fell asleep after her shower and I didn't have the heart to wake her. I really didn't mean to take this long. I looked at her passively. Can we go home now? I still have chores to do. She seemed a little put off, but quickly composed herself. Sure. Katie turned to Joan. I'll see you tomorrow. If you need anything between now and then, call me. Joan nodded and smiled. Don't worry. I know how to find you. I looked at Joan and without a word turned and headed out of the waiting room. Katie had to jump and hustle to catch up with me before the elevator door closed. Kevin, that was rude. Why didn't you say goodbye to Joni? I'm just tired and stressed out. Sitting in that waiting room all afternoon without anything to eat has made me a little irritable. Katie made no comeback as we rode down the elevator. All the way home, not a word passed between us. Finally, as we pulled into the driveway, Katie turned to me. What's going on with you, Kevin? You aren't talking, and when you do, it's almost rude. You just dissed Joan. Nothing. I guess it's the stress. I keep seeing John's face behind that mask. It could have been me just as easily as him. I just wonder how you would react to that. She looked puzzled as I opened the car door. What do you mean by that? I would be as distraught and upset as Joan is. I didn't say anything, walking to the door and letting myself into the house. We found leftovers for dinner. I managed to eat since I had left my sandwich at the hospital. We ate in silence, but I noticed Katie looking at me hard, trying to figure out what was going on with me. I wasn't hiding my feelings, yet I had no desire to force a confrontation with the little information I had. I moved to the den and turned on the TV, finding an old movie to let play in the background. Katie cleaned up the kitchen, glanced into the den, 
and then headed up to our bedroom, closing the door behind her. I sat in the dim room for a while, finally picking up my cell phone. I dialed the number for the battalion chief's office. He sounded like he was already asleep, so I apologized for the late hour and explained that I was struggling with the aftermath of the accident and had contacted a therapist. I told him I needed to take three shifts of personal leave. He understood and reminded me that our contract covered remedial therapy for PTSD, and I could use sick leave. I thanked him and asked that he let everyone know what was going on. After hanging up, I sat and thought about my next steps. I couldn't afford a decent private investigator, which meant I had to handle this on my own. The TV had gone silent after the movie ended, and sitting in the dark, I slowly put together the rudiments of a plan. It would be the first time in our married life that I kept something from my wife. I wasn't comfortable with that, but the need to know what was really going on outweighed my discomfort. I was up and out of the house by 5 a.m., which wasn't unusual. It was a normal shift day, and I was typically gone before Katie woke up. She knew the schedule. There was some concern that if she called the fire station, she'd find out I was on leave. However, I could count on one hand the times she'd called the private line or the station line. If she needed me, she would call my cell phone. With nowhere specific to go, I decided to visit the Walmart down the road and wander the store for a few hours to kill time. One of my favorite parts of Walmart is the sporting goods section. They have a wide variety of gear, not the highest quality, but sometimes you could find a bargain. As I idly shopped, my thoughts were on my situation. I found myself looking at rifle scopes, which were the typical Chinese-made stuff. Then my eye caught a pair of Bushnell binoculars. It suddenly occurred to me that if I wanted to find out what was going on, I needed to be able to do some surveillance from a distance. I soon had the binoculars in a bag tucked under my arm. On the way out of the store, I passed through the electronic section. I had another slight epiphany and turned to look at the digital SLR cameras. Several hundred dollars later, I walked out with a nice Nikon camera, a telephoto lens, and several SD cards. Sitting in the parking lot, I plugged the camera batteries into the data port of the Bronco and started reading the manual. I was delighted to learn that not only could I take extremely high-resolution photos, but I could also make UHD videos. I looked at the clock on the dash display. It was almost 9 a.m. I headed back toward my house, stopping a block away. The neighborhood was not fully developed, and the two lots directly across from our house were empty. There was some brush and a few trees, but nothing that would obscure my view of the front of my home. I parked and waited. A little after 9.30, I saw Katie pull her SUV out of the garage and head down the street. I waited a moment, then eased around the corner. I could see her car a few hundred yards ahead. I had no trouble tailing her from a distance and had a good idea where she was going. As I suspected, she turned down the street where John and Joan lived. This neighborhood was fully developed, so there was no real way I could watch from a distance. I pulled around and parked on the street behind John's house. I took the camera and began snapping pictures of the houses and the neighborhood. If anyone asked, my cover was that I was an appraiser doing a report for a realtor to compare comps in the neighborhood. This would also explain why I was not only wandering up and down the street, but also hiking along the utility easement between the two streets. That route got me close to the back of John's house. Carefully, I checked the windows in the kitchen and the dining room, but couldn't see anything. As I worked my way around the side of the house, I stopped by the master bedroom window. The window was closed and the drapes were drawn, but a narrow slit along one side afforded me a view of about half the room. The foot of the bed was all I could see. What I did see was certainly suspicious. Two pairs of feet and naked legs intertwined on the bed. I couldn't hear much, just some muffled voices, nothing intelligible. I watched as best I could while trying to stay observant of any neighbors who might see me peeking in the window. Suddenly, the dynamic shifted. Joan rose to her knees at the foot of the bed, prompting me to swiftly grab the camera. Despite the scene unfolding before me, I stifled my initial visceral response and continued observing. With little else to witness, I reluctantly departed back to the Bronco. 
I relocated to a vantage point down the street, positioning myself to surveil John's house across the yard. Anticipating Katie's imminent departure, I patiently waited until 3 a.m., enduring the cold, hunger, and fatigue. Finally, as Katie's car lights flickered on and she drove off, I realized she was bound for home, likely to be waiting for me upon my shift's end, which occurred around 7 a.m. As I pondered the frequency of such occurrences, a wave of discomfort washed over me, realizing I was being cuckolded not by another man, but by another woman, my own wife. The revelation left me feeling queasy. Seeking solace, I sought refuge at Denny's, attempting to make sense of the unsettling reality I had witnessed. Despite my efforts, my mind struggled to grasp the situation. Just before seven, I settled the bill and returned home. Upon Katie's arrival, clad in a provocative nightie, my reaction was unavoidable. She couldn't help but notice the tension in the air. Hey, Kevin, usually you're in bed for a bit longer. I'm a bit wound up from work. You know, it was my first shift back since the accident. She made sympathetic sounds and began preparing breakfast. You don't have to bother cooking. I grabbed a bite at the fire station. Not really hungry. She returned the ingredients to the fridge and brought her coffee to the table, sitting across from me. I kept my focus on my own cup. Aren't you going to ask about my day yesterday? Will you tell me the truth? My response seemed to confuse her slightly, but she continued, cheerfully recounting her day, mentioning a shopping trip with Joan and a visit to the hospital to see John. I inquired about John's condition. She replied that there hadn't been much change. I felt a surge of anger. They hadn't been anywhere near the hospital. I had called in the late afternoon, and after identifying myself as John's superior officer checking on him, the duty nurse had informed me that they were tapering off his medication and expected him to regain consciousness the following day. I expressed my gratitude and arranged to visit the hospital later that afternoon. Finishing my coffee, I noticed a peculiar expression on Katie's face. Attempting to offer a reassuring smile, her expression softened slightly upon seeing mine. She spoke with warmth. What's on your agenda for today? The yard could use some TLC. I was thinking of tackling the mowing and tidying up the flower beds. Plus, I have to swing by headquarters this afternoon. The accident investigators need to speak with me. I noticed her disappointment, quickly followed by a hopeful tone. I was hoping we could spend the afternoon together, but duty calls, I get it. I nodded, poured another cup of coffee, and headed upstairs for a shower and change of clothes. When I returned downstairs, Katie was on her way up to get dressed as well. She emerged a few minutes later, wearing a skirt and blouse, surprising me. Are you heading out? I asked. Joni and I are planning another shopping trip, followed by a visit to the hospital. You should go see John. Her suggestion lingered in the air as she left, leaving me to ponder the complexities of the day ahead. She whisked out the front door, the sound of her car reversing out of the driveway, echoing down the street. I exhaled deeply before making my way to the garage. It took me a little over two hours to tackle the lawn and tidy up the flower beds. Afterward, I headed upstairs for a much-needed shower and change of clothes. My first destination was the hospital. As expected, neither Joan nor Katie were there. However, the nurses mentioned that John's wife hadn't been seen for several days caught me off guard. I wasn't permitted into his recovery room, but it was probably for the best, as I wasn't keen on broaching my suspicions with him while he was still sedated. I spent some time talking to him sharing mundane updates about life, work, and his wife's supposed well-being. His eyelids fluttered at the mention of Joan, indicating he might be registering some level of awareness. Leaving the hospital, I made my way back home. On a whim, I drove past John's house. Sure enough, Katie's car was parked in the driveway. I continued on without stopping, returning to my own house. Pouring myself a tall bourbon and coke, I settled into my recliner. Just as I was getting comfortable, Katie breezed in, chattering incessantly as she prepared dinner. I listened, interjecting occasionally while silently processing the information she shared. When I asked about John, she recounted her visit with Joan, 
claiming they spent nearly an hour with him, though he remained unconscious and unresponsive. The deceit seemed to compound with each passing day, leaving me incredulous at how effortlessly Katie spun her web of lies. Gradually, I began to pick up on the inconsistencies and discrepancies. Surely, she must have thought me utterly oblivious. Exhausted by the charade, I eventually excused myself and retreated to bed. I felt her slip under the covers later, molding herself to me in a familiar spooning position. She drifted off to sleep easily, but my mind raced as I lay awake, staring into the darkness for what felt like hours. The next morning I rose earlier than usual, a departure from my typical routine of sleeping in on days off from the fire station. I had some tasks to attend to before Katie woke up. Downstairs I brewed coffee without bothering to tiptoe around. Katie remained undisturbed. As anticipated, I found her phone resting next to her purse on the credenza in the entry hall. Snatching it up, I retreated to the study, keeping the lights off. I vaguely recalled hearing about apps that could remotely extract information from a cell phone. Spending some time navigating through her phone, I explored various apps and services. After identifying one that appeared user-friendly yet comprehensive, I created an account, downloaded and installed the app, and discreetly cleared the browsing history on the phone. It seemed straightforward enough. I returned the phone to its original spot, satisfied with my covert actions. Returning to the study, I powered up my laptop and navigated to the website where I had set up the account. After logging in, I located the link to Katie's phone. As I accessed the dashboard, I was surprised to discover a wealth of options at my disposal. Not only could I download a log of the keystrokes on the phone, but I also had access to its camera and audio functions. For a slightly increased fee, I opted to receive comprehensive reports detailing every website visited, phone call made, and text message sent or received. Without hesitation, I paid the additional fee. Sitting at the computer, sipping on my coffee, I pondered over the information I now had at my fingertips. It seemed increasingly likely that Katie was engaged in an illicit affair with Joan, but the motive remained elusive. Joan had been a close friend for years, their bond deepening even further when she and her husband, John, moved just a few blocks away. Yet, I couldn't shake the nagging question of John's involvement in all of this. How strong was his connection to Joan? The pieces of the puzzle began to align in my mind, painting a troubling picture of betrayal and deceit. Later that morning, Katie set off on her errands, giving me the impression that she'd be out with Joan for most of the day. Their itinerary included a stop at the hospital to visit John. Seizing the opportunity, I decided to pay a visit to the local electronics store. Occasionally, I'd accompany one of the firefighters, a fellow enthusiast of RC airplanes, who frequented the store for parts. I had noticed a section dedicated to what I jokingly referred to as spy gadgets, and I was curious to do some reconnaissance of my own. At the store, I found exactly what I was looking for. After explaining my intentions to the staff, they quickly assembled the necessary equipment. Back in my Bronco, I used my phone to check Katie's car's location via GPS, which indicated she was at the large grocery market about six miles away. I dialed her number. Hey, what's going on? She answered. Just grabbing some essentials so we're stocked up for the week. How about you? I thought I'd swing by John and Joan's place. Noticed their yards looking a bit neglected, so I'll borrow John's mower and tidy up a bit. Give it a neater appearance, I replied, masking my true intentions with casual conversation. That sounds like a plan. Joan and I will be together for the day. After some more shopping and lunch, we'll swing by the hospital in the afternoon. Hopefully John will be awake by then. You should join us, Katie suggested. Sure thing. By the way, you're sounding better, I remarked. Thanks, she replied. I couldn't help but smile to myself. Taking care of John's lawn seemed like the least I could do for him. He always took pride in the landscaping around their house, and I wanted to maintain it to his standards, but I also had ulterior motives. With the neighbors accustomed to seeing my Bronco parked in the driveway, my presence at John's house wouldn't raise any eyebrows. Given that everyone knew John was in the hospital, seeing me mowing the lawn would only further quell any suspicions about my visits. I pulled into John's driveway and parked my Bronco. 
With the garage door opener code in hand, I quickly gained access and hopped onto the zero-turn mower. As I maneuvered around the yard, a few neighbors approached, eager to inquire about John's condition. I provided what information I could and graciously accepted their offers of assistance for Joan and John. After bidding them farewell, I efficiently completed the mowing and trimming tasks, returning the mower to its spot in the garage. The unlocked door leading from the garage into the house made it easy for me to begin my covert operation. Retrieving the bag from the electronic store, uh, I got to work. It took just over an hour to install a discreet pinhole camera in the master bedroom. The camera was cleverly linked to a compact mini laptop concealed in a box on John's workbench in the garage. Knowing that Joan rarely ventured into that part of the garage, I felt confident in its security. An available electrical outlet provided power to the mini laptop, while the camera, equipped with motion sensitivity, streamed a live video feed to the mini laptop and whenever the room was occupied. With a cell phone SIM card installed, the mini laptop could effortlessly transmit the video to the cloud. I marveled at the simplicity and affordability of the setup, realizing I'd need to periodically replace the button battery powering the camera. After tidying up and giving John's cherished mower a thorough servicing, I headed home to freshen up. With a second setup similar to the one installed at John's house, I planned to outfit our own bedroom. Once the camera was discreetly in place and the mini laptop carefully hidden in the attic above our bedroom, I took a quick shower changed into clean clothes, and prepared to head to the hospital. Upon arriving, Joan emerged from the intensive care ward, where John was still closely monitored. Her smile conveyed a sense of relief and happiness. She shared with us that John had regained consciousness intermittently, though he remained frail and unable to speak due to being intubated. Nevertheless, she had conversed with him and encouraged me to go back and see him, Eager to offer whatever comfort I could, I promptly obliged, recognizing the importance of his loved one's presence during his recovery. I found John still resting, the mechanical respirator aiding his breathing. The doctors were taking precautions to prevent pneumonia, closely monitoring his respiratory functions. Standing by his bedside, I hesitated, struck by the sight of his once robust frame now appearing frail and vulnerable. Unsure of what to say, I opted not to voice any suspicions, recognizing the unnecessary stress it might cause. Instead, I spoke of mundane matters, updating him on the goings-on at the fire station and assuring him of everyone's support. Mid-conversation, I noticed his eyes flutter open, shifting to meet my gaze. Though unable to grin due to the tubes in his mouth, his hand lifted thumb extending in a silent gesture of acknowledgement. Encouraged by his response, I continued informing him of the tasks I had completed, from mowing the lawn to servicing his cherished mower. Attempting to nod, he winced, likely due to the discomfort caused by the intubation. I offered my assistance, but he shook his head slowly, indicating he required nothing further. As he appeared to drift back into sleep, I seized the opportunity to bid him farewell quietly exiting the room, hopeful for his recovery yet apprehensive about the challenges ahead. Returning to work for my next regular shift, I was greeted warmly by my colleagues, all eager to hear updates on John's condition. I shared what I knew, keeping everyone informed. During my absence, I learned that we had a new temporary hose man who was already familiar with our station's layout having roved in several times before. I started bringing my laptop to the fire station, storing it securely in my locker. This allowed me to discreetly monitor the cameras, access files on the cloud, and check Katie's cell phone whenever the opportunity arose. The cameras soon began streaming regular video footage, primarily capturing Joan in the bedroom. While I felt a twinge of guilt about invading her privacy, I rationalized it as the necessary sacrifice for uncovering the truth. Similarly, the camera installed in our bedroom provided me with insights into Katie's activities. Though I still found her beautiful, watching her actions on camera prompted a realization about my own physical state, 
seeing myself in the videos motivated me to be more disciplined about exercising and hitting the weights at the fire station, especially as I noticed a slight paunch developing around my middle. It wasn't until late in the evening during that first shift back that I truly grasped the extent of what was happening. To say that it was eye-opening would be an understatement. The revelations from the surveillance footage left me reeling, grappling with emotions ranging from betrayal to disbelief.